I, when I went to get my black belt, uh, Grandmaster Jun Ri, mm -hmm. who's kind of a father of Taekwondo in the United States, he and I met, and he was a big fan of mine, and I became a very big fan of his very quickly uh, when I got to meet him, not so much because of his martial arts, but because of who he is as a person. I originally didn't want to study Taekwondo, I wanted to study Aikido, okay. but I had the chance to study with him personally, and he yeah. traveled with me, and I traveled with him. This is the truth about the martial arts business, brought to you by MartialArtsTeachers.com. I'm your host, John Graydon. I started karate on February 12th, 1974 in Largo, Florida. I instantly knew I'd found my calling. In the 40 plus years since then, I've discovered that in addition to some really great people, the martial arts has more bullies, blowhards, and sociopaths than a prison yard. I've dealt with most of them, and you're going to hear those stories right here on the Truth About the Martial Arts Business podcast. This show is a no-agenda show for martial arts school owners and instructors. If anything, you might consider this to be an attack-the-agenda show, because if you know me, that's what I do. I often think the reason traditional gi pants are cut so high is because of all the BS we're forced to wade through to get to the truth. But before I get to this first show, let me share with you a little bit of history. After Century Martial Arts sued me and my company, Natma, into the ground, into oblivion practically, I moved entirely online with the Martial Arts Teachers Association, MATA, in 2003. The good thing is that MATA has been a great resource for school owners. The not-so-good thing is that I isolated myself, and that's not healthy or productive. Solitude is a gift from God. Isolation is a self-imposed prison and I am breaking out. So I'm excited to tell you that I'm back and better than ever. Today on episode one, the Bruce Lee of motivation, the one and only Tony Robbins shares his experience in the martial arts, specifically with Grandmaster Jun Ri, the late Jun Ri. After that, I'll share with you a teaching tip that will help you in the classroom. This is straight from the Mata Instructor Certification Program at matacertification.com. So if you also look in the show notes below, you'll see links to various sites that we mentioned. Also, you'll see links to subscribe, share, and review this podcast, and I'd greatly appreciate if you would do that. You'll also see an Ask Mr. Graydon link. Click this to record a question or make a comment, or even share a story that you have related to your experience with me or one of my organizations through the years, through the decades. Okay, enough of the setup. Let's get on the floor, line up, and bow into class with Mr. Tony Robbins. Today, I'm very excited to welcome to our program my success sensei, uh -huh. and the success sensei of thousands of others. Please welcome Mr. Tony Robbins. Thanks, John. Very nice to be with you. Uh, Tony, I, of course, I'm extremely familiar with your material. I would consider myself a green belt in the <laughs> <AC>. <laughs> Okay. But some of our viewers might not be. And what I'd like to do is establish a, a point of reference and go back in time a little bit to... a. Uh, a rainy Christmas Eve. Yes, that might be I basically, uh, as you know, start out uh, Christmas Eve. Um, there were quite a few challenges in my family's background, and on Christmas Eve, I got kicked out of my house. Mm. My dad got kicked out too. My mom didn't know martial arts, but you would have thought so. <laughs> she was a pretty powerful lady. And my dad went back east, and I was on my own, and yeah. um, I had to figure out what I was going to do. And my mom and I are super close now. It's one of the best things mm -hmm. ever happened to me. But what it made me have to do is figure out what I was going to do with my life. And I really always believed that, you know, I'd read a lot of books and I'd always been feeding my mind mm -hmm. and feeding my body to really become a successful individual because I grew from a great deal of poverty yeah, and I started studying like it was going out of style. I really wanted to be quote unquote successful. And I made lots of money and then I realized I still wasn't happy. So mm -hmm. uh, I began to, began to sabotage myself because I, I was disillusioned. Here you mm -hmm. were, if you made money, everybody's supposed to love you and it was supposed to be happy and you're going to live forever and ever and be you know, just the way you want life to be. And here I was, all of a sudden, I come back to my friends and go, hey, you know, let's go out and I want to go with you and let's, mm -hmm. let's fly to like uh, Africa or let's go to Egypt and let's raid camels between the pyramids and stuff. And they were excited about this, you know. I said, no, I'll pay for it. Yeah. And then I started getting all this negative. I found myself in a position where, you know, I'd given up. I, I got rid of all the people around me. And I ended up being broke, living in a foot square foot bachelor apartment in Venice, California. You know? <laughs> and washing my dishes in the bathtub and waking up each day, eating my guts out. Because that was my way of changing my emotions. I didn't know what to do with my body. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what to do with my mind. I used my body through food. And I also went out, I mean, you know, I knew, I know the whole story of Luke and Laura in General Hospital. I watched it every day. And, but eventually what happened was I hit rock bottom. You know, I hit that level that I think most martial artists, 
sometimes have to meet before they demand more from themselves. Threshold. You know, exactly, what mm -hmm. I call an emotional threshold. And at that point, I did what we all have to do. I raised my standards. I had to, because yeah. I realized that who I was was much more than what I was demonstrating. Awesome. And some people have to hit rock bottom in a harsh way, and some people just have to realize they're better than everybody else around them, but yeah. that's not good anymore for anymore. Yeah. You can't evaluate your performance by the people around you and expect to really grow. You've mm -hmm. got to always be holding yourself to a higher standard. Mm -hmm. That's how you really become a master at anything. And so I raise my standards, but you know, I watch martial arts all the time, raise standards and say, oh, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this thing and I'm going to make this thing happen. I'm going to achieve this. I'm going to accomplish that. I'm going to execute this way. But they don't believe they can really do it. And so if you raise your standards and you don't change your beliefs, it's over. You've already sabotaged yourself. Mm -hmm. And so I realized I had to work on my beliefs. So I started looking for role models because I figured if somebody else can do it and they start out like me, I can do it too. So mm -hmm. I started with simple things. Who's fat like me or was rather and became thin and stayed thin? And I realized they weren't just going on a diet. They had developed a discipline. They developed a new way of focusing. Food was no longer their emotional outlet. Mm -hmm. They found something else to invest themselves mm -hmm. in, and so I began to do that. And I looked around and saw people who had been broke like me, who started yeah. with nothing and become wealthy, and there were hundreds and hundreds mm -hmm. of role models. And I did the same thing. I mean, less than 12 months, I transformed my relationships. In a month, I lost 30 pounds. In wow. 60 days, 38. I went from totally broke to a million dollar net worth. I moved from my 400 square foot bachelor apartment to the home I have now, which is literally a castle built in 1925 overlooking the ocean. So my message is simple. Mm -hmm. My book is Awaken the Giant Within. We all have the power, but what stops us is our limiting beliefs. We don't raise our standards. We don't change our beliefs. We have begun to believe that we can't do things because we get so disappointed so much of the time. And the last thing, though, is you can have this great standard and you can believe all day long. But the metaphor I often use is, you know, you can be all positive and believing and have all this willpower, but if you're running east looking for a sunset, then you've got a problem. I don't care how enthusiastic you are, how disciplined you are. It's the wrong way to go about it. And I think the same thing is true in martial arts. Yeah, you yeah. see people raise their standards. You see them sometimes get enough belief, mm -hmm. but their training discipline, for example, is never going to produce the result. Or they're really not modeling with excellence their sensei. They're not modeling not only the physiology but the core philosophy of the teachers that they're working with. Critical point, and this is what we call black belt excellence. And the okay. discipline that we learn in karate, the concentration skills we learn in karate, has no value if it does not carry over into our regular lifestyle. So it is truly, you have to you have, to have the core belief that this is the, my new lifestyle. This is the way I like it. And it doesn't happen overnight. No, it doesn't. And I think, you know, when I went to get my black belt, um, Grandmaster Jun Ri, mm -hmm. who's kind of a father of Taekwondo in the United States, um, he and I met, and he was a big fan of mine, and I became a very big fan of his very quickly uh, when I got to meet him. Not so much because of his martial arts skill, although that's impeccable, but because of who he is as a person. And um, I originally didn't want to study Taekwondo. I wanted to study Aikido. Okay. But I had the chance to study with him personally, and he yeah. traveled with me, and I traveled with him. And, and But the goal was to break a record, you know, yeah. do this thing in eight and a half months, and just train more intensely and make it so that I could absolutely be with any, the best of them and produce a result. Well, we did that, but in the process of doing it, I overtrained. Yeah. You know, I didn't. I I was going for absolute what I considered excellence, but mm -hmm. I didn't pay attention to health. Mm -hmm. And to mm -hmm. me, our discipline is really a discipline that is a holistic discipline. It is mind, body, and spirit, and we all talk about that. But it's one thing to talk about; it's another to live it. And then I watch a lot of martial arts, and it becomes mm -hmm. all about breaking bricks or yeah. breaking people or or dominating the next person. And I fell into that a little bit. I have to tell you honestly. So what I've tried to do is is. You know, it's, there's nothing wrong with, with uh, getting off balance mm -hmm. as long as you return to center. And so learning you know, experience. And, and exactly. And my big belief is that success in life in anything, whether it be martial arts or your life, comes from good judgment. Good judgment comes from experience. Yes. And experience, though, often comes from bad judgment. You know, <laughs> the only you learn from it, you know, you're, hopefully you don't have to learn by bad judgment, yeah. but you're going to in some cases. Well, I think everybody wants to change something in their mm -hmm. life. You know, we all want to improve, no matter how successful we are in anything. And the challenge is people, they want to make little changes. A mom who wants to be a great mom, but she'd also like yeah. to have a wife, you gotcha. know? Yeah. Or a martial artist who wants to absolutely the best they can possibly be, but they got to figure out how can they keep their discipline strong and still keep their business mm -hmm. and all the other, you know, all the other mm -hmm. commitments in their life and not drop off in anything. That's exactly. not an easy thing to do. Exactly. So what my life is about is teaching people strategies for creating lasting change. And the key word there are strategies. Yeah. Um, you can go about creating a change. Anybody can, like, lose 10 pounds or something. Lose it and gain it back. It's a lousy strategy. So what I've tried to do in this book is give people the strategies that can help them to create the changes they want emotionally. Because martial arts is all emotion. A lot of people think it's a disassociated emotion. I don't think so. Yeah. But how to get yourself from a state of being frustrated or angry mm -hmm. or fearful or overwhelmed into a state of absolute total focus or a state of absolute passion or joy, mm -hmm. being able to shift gears, not just shift gears into one martial arts focus, yeah. but be able to shift gears into the variety or the full spectrum of what's available to us as human beings. 
I try to show people how to do that specifically in step-by-step -step ways, things you can do in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. For example, if, if we want to change what we feel, we've got to realize all human emotion is controlled by focus. As martial artists, we understand the importance of focus. Critical. But most people don't know how to really focus. They don't know how to do it like physically. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to do it mentally. Mm -hmm. Focus is controlled by questions. Yeah, yeah. So if you want to be in a lousy state, all you have to do is ask yourself, oh man, what's crappy about this? And your brain will find something. Oh, yeah. Or you can say, what's been horrible in my past? And we've all got something that was painful. Why does this always happen to me? Why does this always happen to me? Yeah. Great question. Remember, ask yeah. and you shall receive. Why does it happen? Because you're stupid, because you deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody wants to lose weight and they go, how come I can never lose weight? Because yeah. you're a pig. You know what I mean? That's what your brain will say. If you ask yeah. a lousy question, you get a lousy answer. But if you say, hey, how can I lose weight now and enjoy the process? Mm -hmm. Now you come up with a way to do it that not only works, but you're li likely to do because it's enjoyable. We must control our focus. In the area of physiology, mm -hmm. the best martial artists that I've met are martial artists who not only have the physiology and not only have the execution of mm -hmm. strategy and skills, but they have the mental strategies and they have the core beliefs. Um, I'm blanking on his name, but a gentleman who several years ago won the Chinese full contact martial arts competitions is mm -hmm. Caucasian. I think the mm -hmm. first Caucasian ever do that. I recall where, that. Where, uh, Often they fight to the death. Not yeah. my values, but you know, that's, that's <laughs> a serious trophy. Yeah, it's definitely a serious <laughs> trophy. You know? But this gentleman, his whole strategy, his whole thing was, his belief was, the more energy he expended, the yeah. more energy he had. He's like a turbocharger. And so everybody else is like, going, how much I got left? I just built, you know, I've had nine battles now. You know, what's left of me here? Yeah. He's to like, coast. he's like Terminator. You know, the more he gets, the more he comes. You know, he's but feeding it, on his opponents. Exactly, mm -hmm. absolutely doing. It. And many of us know that intellectually. We've heard about it. and We've studied it. And we've had, you know, various people instruct us and the philosophy of it, very few of us embody it. Mm -hmm. So what I try to do is find, okay, how did he do that? Or I just recently interviewed a man named Stu Middleman. Mm -hmm. He's in New York City. He broke the world's record. He ran 1,000 miles in 11 days. I mean... <laughs> in my cumulative lifetime total. <laughs> I, know, right. I mean, we're talking... He's running 21 hours a day, slept three hours a night, 21 hours straight, 84 to 86 miles a day. Mm -hmm. The most beautiful thing about it, though, is this guy was not a runner. And this was not his skill. And what he did, though, was to do this thing is he had to first work on his beliefs. I mean, you know, he had to hold himself to a higher standard than anybody else. If he was comparing himself to other people, he wouldn't run a thousand miles. He did what I talk about. Higher standard than anybody else said, this is your standard. Now, if he had the standard and didn't believe it. So he went down to South America, and there's a group of Indians there that once a year on a holiday, they run 75 miles in a day for fun. <laughs> Kind of an interesting belief system, right? <laughs> and so he started picking their brains, and he started adopting their strategy. And once he could see it could be done in a day, all he had to do was expand it. Mm -hmm. Then he had to train his body to burn fat. Because, you know, most people like run a marathon, they eat carbohydrates, you yeah. know, and a bunch of spaghetti so they don't hit the mm -hmm. wall. Well, mm -hmm. you can't run three marathons a day for 11 days and not hit the wall unless you change your biochemistry. So he literally trained his biochemistry to burn fat, which is what everybody wants. You know, everybody wants to burn fat. And so I talk about that in the book. So the mm -hmm. book is filled with strategy after strategy on what you can do specifically to make a change in each area and then how to develop it as a habit or as a lifestyle. So it isn't a temporary change, but it's something that's ongoing and it's something that's fun. That's part one of my interview with Tony Robbins. Now it's time for our Teach Like a Pro Tip of the Week. On average, it takes about three or four years to earn a black belt, but very little of that time is spent on the science of teaching and learning. The Mata Instructor Certification Program provides you with the tools you need to create a productive classroom environment. This program was authored by 18 different veteran black belts who are also experts in their respective fields such as law, psychology, pedagogy, movement science, motivation and communication. Find out more at MataCertification.com. Here is this week's Mata Teach Like a Pro Tip of the Week. Module 1, How Students Learn. Lesson 4, How to Give Clear Directions. Subtitle, What to Do Versus What Not to Do. A common mistake in the classroom is delivering instructions that do not provide clear expectations. When given instructions, be careful of the language that you use. Avoid giving instruction that defines the behavior by the negative. For instance, don't drop your guard. It tells the student what not to do, but doesn't tell the student what to do. You may think, well, it's obvious. If I don't want their guard down, the only other place is up. That is shallow thinking. You're leaving the interpretation of the instruction to the student instead of being crystal clear and authoritative. A clear and direct instruction to keep your guard up leaves little to the imagination. Even better, if you can attach a picture to the instruction, that helps the students to visualize what you want. For example, when I say guard up, think of holding two phones to your ears. 
So then they have a clear picture of what holding your guard up is like. Even when you use more proactive, positive language, the message still may be vague. For instance, pay attention. Does the student really understand how to pay attention? Has anyone ever taught them how to pay attention? Again, what may seem obvious to you as someone who has taken and taught hundreds, if not thousands of martial arts lessons, that may not be so clear to an eight-year-old in his first month of training. Does he know your specific expectations for paying attention? The command, pay attention, provides little guidance because it fails to teach. One way to make this clear is to teach the students that when you say, eyes on who, they respond with eyes on you. Teach students early that when you're speaking, all conversation stops. Each student turns to face the instructor at parade rest with eyes focused on the instructor and remaining silent. Teach this to your assistant instructors so they can be role models in class. For instance, the class is practicing a headlock escape and your assistant is doing wandering corrections. When the instructor calls for the class to look at him or pay attention or everybody look here, the assistants immediately stop whatever they're doing and turn to parade rest with eyes on the instructor. That example as a role model demonstrates exactly how to pay attention. This provides useful guidance. It's easy to remember, solution-oriented, and hard to misunderstand. If you're not clear in telling the student what to do, you can't really tell whether the student has complied. A student may protest, but I was paying attention. If you don't have a clear standard for what is paying attention, you're going to waste valuable classroom time re-explaining something that should be second nature by then. When the student has clear instructions to follow, compliance is easy. So here are four keys to giving clear directions. Number one, specific. Effective directions are specific. They focus on manageable and precisely described actions that students could take, like put your hands up by your ears as though you had two phones. Two, concrete. Effective directions are not just specific, they involve clear actions that any student knows how to do. When directing a student to pay attention, he may not know how to do that. But if the instructor is to put your eyes on me, that is something no student can misunderstand or not know how to do. If the student appears to struggle, get more concrete. Turn your body to face me, look at me with your eyes, listen to me with your ears. If you have any question, raise your hand. These are real th physical, simple, commonplace. There's no gray area or any prior knowledge required to comply. Number three, sequential. Effective directions should describe a sequence of concrete specific actions. In the case of the student who needs help paying attention, I might advise him, John, turn your body to face me. Look at me with your eyes, listen to me with your ears. That is pretty much in order. Number four, observable. The instructors give John actions that the instructor could plainly see him do. This is important. The instructor provided him with a series of steps that were specific, sequential, and simple enough that any student could reasonably be expected to do them. That leaves John with very little wiggle room to stray. What to do allows you to distinguish between incompetence and defiance by making your commands specific enough that they can't be deliberately misinterpreted and helpful enough that they explain away any gray areas. However, it's important to distinguish between incompetence and defiance. If I ask John to pay attention or sit up or get on a task and he doesn't, knowing whether he will not or cannot matters. If he cannot, the problem is incompetence. He needs teaching. He needs training. If he will not, the problem is defiance. And we all respond to these situations differently. Well, that's a wrap. Our first episode is in the can. What do you think? I know it's just show one, but please take a moment to share, review, and subscribe. I've devoted my entire adult life to the martial arts, and this is my way of giving something back. I hope you enjoy it. 
Be sure to subscribe, and I'll see you next week. Until then, keep your guard up.